He is the husband to Mary and the father of three remarkable children. Jason has authored several books, including The Politics of Humanism and Health for All of Life. He is the teaching pastor of Cross and Crown Church in Northern Virginia. Amen. Jason Garber. All right. Trying to decide if I want to use this, whatever this platform thing is. Yeah, would you help me with that? We're, we're all not as tall as you. Thanks for embarrassing me. Yeah, I'd say that's a little bit better. I, I don't want to do a balancing act while I'm up here, so. <laughs> Three hymnals back here standing on. All right, well, it's good to be with you all. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, join me in three different passages. We're going to be in Isaiah 33, Matthew chapter 28, and James chapter 1. So you can follow along accordingly there. Isaiah 33, 22, Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, and James chapter 1. All right, let's start with Isaiah 33, 22. These are the words of God. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, he will save us. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then James chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be doers, excuse me, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for the work that you are doing among us. It is very much evident that your grace has been poured out and that your Holy Spirit has been at work here during this conference. I ask and pray that our time tonight would be challenging, engaging, and honoring to you. Father, we are a nation neck deep in sin and unrighteousness, and we need you to deliver us. We also acknowledge that unless you grant us the repentance, we won't do it. We ask for a tangible, palpable repentance to spread throughout the land so that we may return unto you. Would justice, true justice, prevail? In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, it is definitely good to be here with all of you, meeting some new people and seeing some friends I haven't seen in many years. And it's kind of funny because sometimes you go to places like this and you realize, wait a second, I know you, but I only know you in Facebook, Zuckerberg land. And uh, that's a shame, but it's good to, to come to these types of things so you can put faces and personalities behind names and profile pictures. So it's, uh, it's definitely an honor to be here. And I'm grateful that many of you, um, all of you, and I guess some maybe had to bounce out of town early, but you made the effort to come to be here to do this most important work. And the work of abolition is, of course, an ongoing work. Uh, it's ongoing as long as there are enemies of the gospel who have yet to be footstooled by King Jesus, there will always be needs, uh, a need for abolitionists. We will always need abolitionists. As long as evil is doing its ugly work of deconstructing and marring and disfiguring the image of God and men and women and children, there will always need, there will always be this need for self-conscious people, men, women, and children, all the children here, you too, here today, insisting upon the priority of the kingdom of God, interposing against all manner of evils. There will always be that, that need. So what we are up against seems absolutely like an impossible task. We clearly live in a culture of death where little image bearers are being assassinated, assassinated dismembered, um, chemically poisoned every single day. 
And when we include, as we definitely should, the IVF Holocaust, the numbering, numbers are staggering. Staggering numbers. Numbers that Stalin and Pol Pot and others would love to have had racked up in their rap sheet. For the abolitionists, standing up to this sort of evil is, of course, doubly hard. Not only do we have a culture expressing its self-worship through the murder of children, we also face opposition of a different sort when ostensible Christians, um, biblically illiterate pastors, and generally apathetic pro-lifers stand in our way. As I'm fond of saying, I have pagans to the left of me and apathetic Christians to the right. There's jeering and sneering, of course, on both sides, and all of this means that both of my ears have to listen to their whining rather than just one. See, for the unregenerate, epistemologically confused pagan, I expect them to place their own subjective rationalizations over and above the objectivity of God and his law. I expect that from them. I expect for them to posture themselves in, in the supreme place of their own lives. Their comfort, their pleasure, their, their conveniences matter most to them. At the mill this morning, uh, Wiersma was preaching, preaching uh, fire, as is normally the case, and a gentleman leaves and a young child's in the back, and I, we just can't afford another child, we just can't afford... That's convenience. It's convenience, it's subjectivism. It's a man who is epistemologically unconscious. He doesn't understand who he is. He doesn't know who God is. So their propensity to self-worship is obviously uh, is there. It's rather obvious for everyone to see. And their atonement theology has led them to the place of child sacrifice. But what about the Christians? That, that's the, the pagan. What about the, the Christians over here on the right side? Ought they to take up their cross and follow Jesus? Should they not count the cost of following our Lord and readjust their lives accordingly? Does not the gospel of the kingdom compel us to live in a different way altogether? To labor with different tools? To fight with different weapons? And the answer, of course, is obvious. Jesus told us repeatedly to count the cost and the majority of Christian churches in evangelical America today have proven that they're really, really bad at math. Now, I want to look at those three texts and just sort of explain them real quickly and then focus back on the gospel imperative of abolitionism. That's what I was tasked with. Wayne had said, hey, back in 2017, you need to preach that again. And I said, well, I'm going to finagle it a little bit. So here we go. In Isaiah 33:22, we read this. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. A verse you should have highlighted, underlined, and handy. Basic to Christian theology, philosophy, and anthropology is the truth that the triune God, and only the triune God, is the integration point of all things. He is the integration point of all things. God is, in the Latin phrase, a se. He is um, in and of himself. He is perfect. He is good. He is righteous. He is holy. It means that he's altogether perfect, he's independent, he's, he's perfectly holy. And in and of himself, he is complete. Uh, the aseity of God means that God doesn't need anything. He's not looking for something to fulfill something that's lacking in him. So Christian doctrine tells us that God, the God who is there, the God who is not silent, to borrow from Schaefer, the one who is not lacking in any way, he grants the universe, we know, meaning, intelligibility, and purpose. And the God of the Bible is the integration point that holds all things together. Everything is held together by this God who is in and of himself perfectly sufficient. So when you're talking to someone on the streets, one of the most basic approaches to engaging their worldview, uh, of course, in order to persuade them to repent and believe the gospel, is to push the antithesis. Push the antithesis. Show them the logical end of their worldview, the end of which is utter meaninglessness. So I, I call them whiny socialists, but they're really nihilists too. Nihilists in denial is where this worldview ends up. Now, Isaiah tells us here that the Lord is judge. He is judge. The ultimate responsibility for the balancing of the universal books belongs to the Lord. He is the judge. And as such, he is also our lawgiver, Isaiah says. 
This means that God is, in fact, the legislative branch of the universe. So now immediately we have a problem. The laws of God, the laws of men, as we'll see in a minute. So he is our lawgiver. His law, we know, takes priority, and only his law, and in his law, do we find any sort of answers for any sort of social order. It is the law of God that transcends and rises above the tepid laws of men. Now, Isaiah also says that God is our king, the Lord is our king, and that he will save us or he will deliver us. While I take issue, of course, with the United States government and its humanistic underpinnings, um, I agree with Gary North, who sm he says that someone smelled a rat in Philadelphia. There was a rat in Philadelphia. But we have three aspects to God's governance of the universe here in this text. Judicial, he is judge. Legislative, he is the lawgiver. And in fact, we have executive, he is our king. All three are present here. Now, if those three aren't acknowledged at a, in a civil magistrate's level, of course, we have a problem, and that's what we have going on right now. Now, I point this out because we cannot defend the gospel and the integrity of God's law in the public eye by adopting humanist presuppositions, okay? We don't say that abortion is murder because the Constitution says such and such, you know. Oh, the Constitution, as if that was ultimately our authority. We say that abortion is murder because it violates the law of God, period. Very simple, right? Flip to Matthew 28. This is a passage I know many of you know, know by heart. You, you, you know what it is, and I, I felt like it was worth reviewing anyway tonight. Here, Jesus affirms what was given to him at his birth. What, was, what is Jesus affirming before he ascends to the heavens? He was affirming something that he was given, given at his birth. And not many people make this connection, but the connection is Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, for to us a child is born. So the prophet Isaiah, and of course this is acknowledged by the gospel writers, but the prophet Isaiah says when this child comes, what will rest upon his shoulders? The government. That's the government of the universe. The responsibility of judge, lawgiver, king. So Jesus here in the, in the New Testament, we find him after his um, death, burial, and resurrection. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth. Go on the basis of that, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So abolitionists are disciple makers. Amen? We're disciple makers. We're trying to disciple people. We are, in many ways, the tip of the ecclesiological spear. Abolitionists are the tip of the ecclesiological spear. I know they want to elevate pastors and elders, and there's a role for that, no doubt. But abolitionists are the ones who are out fighting evil on the streets, at the murder mill. You are, in fact, in many ways, the tip of that spear. Abolitionists, by their very nature, are culture engagers, evangelists, prophets, people out heralding the message of God and his law. Paul tells us, to expose that which is evil, a great verse in Ephesians, bringing those evil things to the light of the law of God. And this requires, obviously, an inherent conflagration with the culture. The, the world doesn't want it to get out what it is doing. They don't want it to get out entirely. But now, of course, we've seen the truth. They know it's a child. They don't care. But our job is to keep shining the light wherever the light needs to go, which happens to be everywhere on, these, on this earth. But part of the point here is that our task as people who love Jesus and his gospel is to go on the basis of Christ's complete and total sovereign authority and power and teach people who, are, who, who then are to be true image bearers of God, being true image bearers that they're called to be. The people that you get spit upon, right, that, that spit upon you, who, who curse you, and uh, the lady today is so ironic, you know, it's, it's a mom's choice, and blankety blank, and, and the back of the bumper sticker says coexist, and it's just so ironic, and I want her to stop and say, you don't really believe that. You don't really believe that. So according to the Great Commission, we're supposed to baptize them, we know that, but many Christians forget this latter part. We're supposed to teach them. We're supposed to teach them something. 
There's didasticism involved here. What we're supposed to teach is what? The commands of God. Look, you'll, you'll see a lot of signs these days. I've seen them up in Northern Virginia, several places. You know, science is real and love is love. And What does the Bible tell us, though? See, regarding that phrase, love is love, it just irks me so much. I expect that sort of intellectual dishonesty, sophomoric intellectual dishonesty at like a, you know, first grade playground. Love is love. And they're just teasing each other. But we have grown adults putting it in their yard. What does the Bible tell us? It tells us that if we love Christ, we'll do what? Obey his commands. Romans 13 says that love is the fulfilling of the what? The law, not your feelings. So love is not love. Love is law. And to teach people what love really is, is to instruct them in the law of God. So we go based on the authority of Christ. We go baptizing. We go teaching them. And we go knowing that he will be with us until the end of the age. Now the last text, if you want to flip there to James 1. James 1.22 which reads this, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I find this verse to be one of the most devastating critiques of evangelicalism today. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What James, the brother of our Lord, is urging is for us to consider what true faith looks like. True faith, in other words, true belief, a true grasping, a a true apprehending, being arrested by the grace of God, a true belief is faith that works itself out in obedience to the law word of God. That's what faith is, true faith. Covenantal men are doers of the word, not merely hearers. In other words, a true believer in the gospel is someone whose hearing has led to doing. That is, taking what the gospel gives to you and producing something with it. You're supposed to take the gospel, the thing that's apprehended your life, and you're supposed to produce with it. You're supposed to do something with it. Economic productivity. Justice. Strong, healthy, non-atomistic families all of Christ for all of life. See, when you understand the gospel, you understand that this is what the gospel does. It's the natural outworking of this good news. It's a feature that's inherently built into its programming. See, hearing leads to doing, which leads to biblical capital. See, any version of Christianity that does not insist upon the doing of the law and and the justice of God is a Christianity that must be confronted. That's the other thing. Pagans to the left, apathetic Christians to the, le- to the right. Both of them have to be confronted. They have to be jarred out of this stupor. We'll come back to this in a second. Now, think back with me for a minute. We're going to journey back to the garden here in a second, the Garden of Eden. When, when the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, he offered them several things to consider. To begin, when he told them that you will not surely die, the accuser basically questioned God's predestinating governance of man. God isn't sovereign. God isn't in charge of all things. Thus, if, if, if God's law is capricious, it's assailable, it's arbitrary, and, and ultimately it's unpredictable, God's decrees are meaningless. And frankly, the consequences for disobeying God's law word really aren't that legitimate. The world is free for man to explore, to make his own meaning, to become a law unto himself. Satan urges them and tempts them some more. He says, you will not die. After all, the reality is God is envious of you. The lie which was being exchanged in that moment continued. Because God's law is, in fact, questionable, right? We can, it can be questioned, it's, it's, clear that, it's clear that God wants, he just wants to make you jump through hoops, to frustrate you, to prevent you from self-discovery. 
To obey God's demands is actually enslavement. And you don't want to be a slave, do you? Satan reasons some more. To, to be a truly liberated man, you have to disregard what he has told you. God's law is oppressive. Rebellion is freedom. And lo and behold, Satan becomes the first anarchist and the first statist. See, the politics of rebellious men stems from another presupposition of the accuser. You won't die. Besides, God knows that when you eat of that tree, you will be like him, right? You'll be like God. That is, you will be a God. And you'll be able to determine for yourself that which is good and evil, just like God does. You see, the enemies of Christ do not find it fulfilling enough to simply disregard the commands of God. It's not fulfilling enough. One must establish his own law in, in place and then place himself on the plane of divinity. See, rebellious men are on a quest to assert their own divinity and sovereignty. That's what they're doing. That's why they continue to murder children. That's why ostensible Christians who show up to the murder mill are killing their child. They're on a quest for divinity. They will, for example develop their own confessional statement. Love is love. That's a confessional statement. It's like their own Westminster confession of faith slapped in the yard. Love is love. Yep. See, they'll, they'll will put forth their confessional statement and illustrates their theological convictions. They will assemble in the streets with their, I call it the arrogance flag, and proudly display their catechistic fervor. And what exactly is underneath this seismic shift that we see in our culture? You know what's underneath it all? A battle of confessions. Whose confession will win and establish a society? That's the issue here. Either Jesus is Lord or the state is Lord, right? But someone's going to be established as Lord. Someone will be judge, someone will be lawgiver, and someone will be king. And the question is, will it be men or will it be the risen Christ? See, there is one final stage of man's rebellion outlined in Genesis 3, and that being when man longs to become his own determiner of law. See, autonomy was the bait of Satan, the accuser. That was the bait. No more transcendent sovereignty of God. No more, quote, you know, oppressive laws. No more of that. Good and evil, you can make that into anything that's moldable, situational, pragmatic, in a word. See, the philosophy is Sartre, comes to a head. Man is not a creature of God. We can't have that. Man makes his own essence. A loss of freedom of choice is evil. Undermine God, you'll be fine. See, all of these elements are the problems that we see facing us right now in this nation. The humanistic declaration states it this way. Number one, God is not sovereign. Number two, his law is no good. And number three, his governance is unwise. God needs our help. See, this is the spirit of, spirit of our age. It's obviously untenable, but it is the spirit of the age. And the question I was asked here to address here tonight is, well, does the gospel itself that we see heralded in the Bible, founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, does that have anything at all to say to this unrighteous proclivity? And the answer is, of course it does. We insist that it does. You see, the kingdom of God, how would you define the kingdom of God? Here's what I would say if I was asked that question. The kingdom of God is the covenantal social order of heaven that came down to the earth in the person of Christ. See, what we are talking about is not to be a truncated and reduced down to merely having your sins forgiven so that you can go to heaven when you die. As much as we believe in the forgiveness of sins, as much as we believe absent from the body, present with the Lord, definitely. But the good news is the fact that Jesus has already been established as the Lord of the world. That's the good news. Okay, the, 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 the issue of sin, you had uh, atonement in the Old Testament, but what's, what's the new part of this? What's the good news? Something that we can grasp, and that's the fact that Jesus is Lord. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's, it's for the world. It's for all of the world and everything in the world. It establishes the sovereignty of God. It establishes the supremacy of his law, the governance of God and his institutions. See, the gospel of God, we know it's the power into salvation, Right? It is, we know that, but anything less than the salvation of man and his institutions, 
culture itself and productivity, anything short of the salvation of all of that, is a truncated and diminished gospel and must be rejected. Pietism is crippling the church. And what passes in the majority of churches today is this truncated, we call it uh, atonement onlyism gospel. The message of Christ is boiled down to a sinner's prayer and an altar call. And the frustrating part about this is it's not like they're just asserting this. They are staunchly defending it. I can't rescue babies. That's not a gospel issue. We're talking about different gospels. See, when you hear churchmen say things like, oh, that's not our calling. How many have heard that? It's not, it's not our calling. Too many hands, too many hands. Uh, that's not our calling. Or, you know, we give money to pregnancy centers, uh, a good and fine thing, I suppose. What you're really being told is our gospel is very small. We're supposed to just preach the gospel and not get caught up in politics. How many have heard that one? Well, let's give that a run, shall we? Did Noah just preach the gospel when he told everyone to repent or they would drown in the sea of God's wrath? Did Moses just, just preach the gospel when he demanded the magistrate Pharaoh release God's people and humble himself before the Lord? Amen. We're not done. Did Joshua just preach the gospel when the Canaanites were vomited out of the land for transgressing God's law? Did the prophets just preach the gospel when they, were told, they told the civil leaders to repent or fall by the sword of Assyria and Babylon? And how about Elijah, who took the sword to the priests of Baal? Did at any point during that slaughter, did he stop and say, hold on, folk, did you ever ask Jesus into your heart? See, what about John the baptizer? I mean, now we're going New Testament, right? Because some people think the Old Testament's a little bit scary. I happen to love it. What about the, John the baptizer? Did he just preach the gospel when he told Herod that it was not lawful for him to have his brother's wife? Did Jesus, our Lord, just preached the gospel when he excoriated the Pharisees for being a bunch of half-wit ninnies. Amen. See, the great besetting sin of modern-day Christianity is unbelief. Amen. It's unbelief. A willful refusal to see the earth-shattering ramifications of the gospel of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Note the word willful. Willful. A failure to see the comprehensive nature of the gospel is making us entirely irrelevant to the social issues of our day, the social evils of our day, whether it's abortion, executive overreach during the so-called pandemic. Everybody, you know, talks about, oh, the pandemic, and I just kindly, could you just stop saying that? Could you say the government's response to the so-called pandemic? That's what crushed us. Let's be truthful about it. Whether it's any of that or taxation or status subjugation in any of those types of forms, all of these issues have gone on unhindered because Christians do not believe in the total lordship of Jesus Christ. Forty years without a bill of abolition? See, if Christians were to wake up to this reality, we would see sweeping repentance with sweeping change across this nation. The church would wake up and see that Jesus is, in fact, the abolitionist par excellence. Amen. He came to put an end to Satan, sin, and death. The gospel announcement is all about the abolition of the powers and principalities of the earth. Amen. Your own Savior that you confess is an abolitionist, by definition. The gospel announcement itself is an abolitionist manifesto. Right? The abolitionist son of man has come and he, as the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. He buries those evils. He buries the sin. He destroys the evil one. He casts the evil one out. See, because he has been established as Lord and King and because the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice, we can, in fact, abolish child sacrifice. See, a, a refusal to abolish it is a refusal to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. Bottom line. That's what you can tell Christians who are up against you in your fight. Maybe even family members. It's a refusal to acknowledge the lordship of Christ. Which, by the way, is why the pro-life movement is anti-Christian. Think about that. It is God who is the transcendent lawgiver, and it is man who is accountable to him. 
This accountability necessarily entails trusting in the right blood atonement. There is, in fact, blood guilt because of sin, and rebellious men need an atonement. But the question is, where will he find it? The women's clinic or the cross? Those are the options. This right here is gospel preaching. Whose blood can cover your sin, Christ's or the blood of infants? The Bible tells us that the Lord prepares our hands for war. Psalm 144.1. Teach that in your Sunday school classes. In the gospel, he trains us to do battle with a world run amok. God destroys his enemies one of two ways. One, he converts them, pulls up a chair and calls them a friend. Or two, he destroys them. He breaks them so that they're no longer relevant to history. He is our judge. He is our lawgiver. He is our king. And we have a major problem in our culture. This is not news to any of you, of course, but everyone wants to talk about justice. You've noted that? Everyone wants to talk about justice, but few want to do the hard intellectual labor of both defending it and establishing it. The pagans, they're all for trying their humanist versions of it. They're not shy about it. Ram it through the, the, the nut jobs in D.C. I live 40 miles from Babylon. It's horrific sometimes. But we're there fighting. But they're all for trying it. They're, they're pushing their bills through. They're insisting on their confession. And I say this a lot. It bears worth repeating. But even Karl Marx himself had a vision for the future. Marx has an eschatology of victory. The same, however, cannot be said of the church. If we're going to seek to establish justice, we need to know that justice is, in fact, the natural outworking of the gospel. Justice and biblical ethics applied is gospel applied. Okay, burn that in your brain. That's what you need to know. So it matters, we know, that civil magistrates obey Christ, Psalm 2. It matters that we confront, and that is the right word, confront magistrates and hold their feet to the fire. They have a job to do. Every magistrate in this nation from the federal level down to your local sheriff and county board of supervisors, ought to have an abolitionist in their ear all the time. They ought to join the unrighteous King Ahab and say, is it you, abolitionist troublemaker of my county and state? It is I. I'm back. <laughs> Contending for the faith is what it means to do the work of the gospel. We announce with the authority of heaven that Jesus Christ is Lord. And our job, our task as Christians, is to make people upset about that. Jesus is Lord. Jesus didn't die so we would relax and get cozy. He died so that we would get to work. If the gospel you believe in your head hasn't compelled you to labor for justice with your hands, you don't really understand the true gospel in your heart. So our biggest strategic issue is the fact that we're not getting thrown out of places anymore. Some are. I've been asked to leave without a mask several times. I guess that counts. <laughs> I'm sorry, is my smile offensive? Okay. But the reason that's not happening, by the way, is because we are not saying anything remotely significant or disturbing. Be nice and loving is really not a disturbing message. Nope. <laughs> Amen. It actually bothers me when I hear that. Yeah. Be nice and loving. You don't know what that is. The dictionary is ours. You keep trying to copy it and rewrite it. It's ours, though. So it's high time that we get back to saying with conviction in our bellies and fire in our bones that Jesus is king, which means that Jesus gets to tell Caesar what to do. The kingdom of God wants nothing at all to do with incremental compromise. Like the heartbeat bill you saw, I'm sure, in Texas. It's just a bill that gives mothers and fathers permission to kill their children. Incrementalism is an error because the kingdom of God is not after partial dominion. Jesus has all authority. The, the, the gospel of the kingdom is comprehensive, we know, because the world is in comprehensive sin. Because Jesus is Lord, our job is to go about announcing to the world that in the capital city, guess what? There was a new king who was enthroned. Had you heard yet? A new king has been established. The Lord Jesus, he's enthroned now. And we're out telling everybody about it. And your job is to obey him. 
Amen. And he has a rod of iron, by the way, if you don't. Because he is justice. See, he bought the world with his blood, and nothing short of worldwide conquest will do. Jesus abolished death. Therefore, follow me, we must abolish human abortion. See, the task of the church is to rid the land of idols, confront them wherever they lie, especially in the public square. That's our task. We ought to gut the pantheons, gut the pantheons and reconstruct society based on the law word of God. And you might say, well, I'm not into politics. Guess what, friends? If you're in Christ, you're already involved in politics. You're already in it. <laughs> you're already there. You can't opt out. There's not a clause in the contract where you can opt out of that particular thing. No, you're in. You are in. And either the church is going to work tirelessly to compromise the systemic injustice of, of abortion, or guess what's going to happen? The church is going to be found to be the ones compromised. We are abolitionists because the gospel demands it. Jesus walked out of the tomb, which means the child murder must end. And my goodness, do we need men, women, and children with courage to step up and interpose. There are a lot of Christians who say that they don't like abortion, but not liking it isn't the issue. Do you hate it enough to do something about it? If Christ lays claim to everything in the world, and guess what he does, then the only thing left to do is to press, keyword, Press the crown rights of King Jesus into every single nook and cranny on this beautiful earth that we enjoy. When truth and justice and beauty is assailed, we must rise and we must fight. When God's word, which provides a man or woman with the epistemological foundations necessary for making sense of the world, for calling a thing what it is because God said it is a thing, when all of that is called into question, we go back to the ancient past, we go back to the word of God, and what do we do? We get louder. We get louder. When a social order like ours is torn asunder by humanist politicians and apathetic Christians, we step foot into that arena, if, even if we're alone, and we boldly say, thus saith the Lord. If Jesus rose from the dead on this earth, then he is in fact Lord of the earth. And no amount of squishy, even jellyfish nonsense and theology changes this. No amount of secularism changes this fact. The gospel, there is a gospel imperative to the work of abolition, so we need to get rowdy. Amen? Amen. Jesus is Lord, and we mean it. Let's pray. Father, we give you the glory and we give you the praise. Thank you for our time tonight. Um, I'm encouraged by the the folks here who are hungry for your word who are hungry to see justice prevail in this land father we come before you humbled by the truth that our nation is a pagan nation and we have long since rejected you but we confess with boldness that you are, in fact, our king, our, law, our lawgiver, and our judge. So may this truth be heralded, Father. May magistrates repent. May justice be established in Christ's name. Amen.